Hello, Ooh. ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Liberia History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In tonight's edition of the History Channel, we're going to be looking at the extraordinary life and death of E.J. Roy. That's how we call him in Liberia. The full name, Edward James Roy. Our presenter on the History Channel is Carl Famule. You know, Carl is not a... It's not a, I don't want to say real name, but call Ye Ye, right? Ye Ye. Call? Welcome. Not Ye Ye. Ye. Oh, is that Ye? Huh? I said call, is that Ye? Ye Ye. Oh, Ye. Two syllables. Ye Ye. Meaning of uh, uh, goodwill or good intentions. Good, good intentions. And our intentions are good tonight. We bring you the <laughs> laboratory channel. We're going to be talking about the extraordinary life and death of E.J. Roy. Oh, what makes his life extraordinary? Oh, we're going to talk about that in great right. detail. We're going to talk about that in great detail. Um, but welcome. Thank you. I think you know, Liberians have so many extraordinary human beings that that country has either produced or attracted. And there's just, you know, there's a bottomless uh, a well of wealth um, in human, I call them human giants, in giants in, in, in sense, sense of persona and accomplishment, uh, whose shoulders that we're actually standing on. And the more we know about them, the more uh, I think our collective self-esteem as a country will, will be raised. Um, today I had a great conversation on social media about Wolo, the first uh, Liberian to graduate from Harvard University. And I posted on my page one of his uh, articles that he wrote. Um, so anyway, there's so many, so many, but Roy, Roy is, is one of many extraordinary people. Uh, and uh, that we're going to discuss over time. And today I am uh, very excited. We're gonna get into a lot of detail initially about his early life, uh, because I think one of the, the issues that, that I've noticed is that when you know the person's biography, you know from whence they've come, it's better to understand kind of how and why they behaved and conducted themselves the way they did um, when they became uh, of importance to Liberia. We'll do the same when we talk about Edward Wilmot Blyden and others. And, and Deep Will Twer was another one of, of the giants uh, uh, upon who we stand. I'm having trouble hearing you, Dennis. Sorry, I can't hear you. You, you mentioned uh, Deep Twer and B. Waller. So I want to tell you a little story before we even start. <laughs> okay. The story is told that uh, it was Deep Twer who first came you know, when they all went to school and he came with a master's degree. Yes. And so when he came with the master's degree, they, they, uh, his people, especially the group, were excited. I mean, this was the highest education they have seen. So later on, <laughs> we wallow now came with a PhD. <laughs> people were yeah. not excited. They said, what? They said, master? They said, no. So they started leaving that uh, we already have D2 who has a master's degree. And then this man, what is PhD? They didn't know PhD. So Dietro was the one who explained, he said, no, this man is more educated than I am. Then they asked him a crew, Oble Master, he got master, he said, no, then they started leaving. He said, oh no, he has twice what I have. So he asked, master, master. So he said, oh, master, master, Oble, is it master? <laughs> it was at that point before they started to actually exalt him. But before that, master was supreme. I see why y'all like to call our president doctor, doctor, y'all uh, uh, <laughs> so so Because when you have a doctor degree, you're just doctor. Even if you have two, you're still just doctor. But we have to say doctor, doctor. I understand yeah, it now. <laughs> yeah, because they didn't understand that the PhD was shut. Because master was the higher education. Yeah, ma well, the word master, I mean, right. you've right. mastered something. You know, right. what they call a doctorate in philosophy. What does that mean anyway? Right, it was even lower. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <It's> master, master. <laughs> so today, if you go to if you go to a crew coast territory and you talk PhD, they may understand that. But before then, you have to say two masters. Master, uh, master. 
And, and that then, is funny. And, and so the good thing you said was, uh, uh, if we know the people, if mm -hmm. we know them for real, then we have something to proud of. You know, at, at the end of the Civil War, I had a, a philosophy. I had something. I said, well, maybe, like, bro, because we don't have anyone to protect. We don't have anything that we take pride in. We don't have anyone to look up to to say, oh, yes. As a result, we didn't have trouble destroying anything and destroying anybody. Yeah. And, and this comes as a result of England. Because if you know, if we went to Ghana and they start talking about Kwame Nkrumah, I went to Guinea, they started to talk about Samori Touré. But when I was in Liberia, I did not really hear of anyone that, you know, people will be like, we can honor as our hero. And so that's why I think this is very important. So when you say the extraordinary life and death of E.J. Raw, that was why I asked what makes him extraordinary. And it's good because if we have those people, if we have people to who we can sing praises to, then we have something to protect, then we have things to hold on to, even if everything is falling apart. In the absence of that, we just look at everybody, especially those before us. Oh, man, everybody, we just talk them down. So thank you for bringing up this up. Yeah. All right. So E.J. Roy. Yes. 1850 so, to 1871. Yes. So this is likely going to be a two-part series because I'm hoping, I'm not sure how many people are watching, but I really would like this to be interactive. Um, but we'll continue if we can get all the way to the end. Great. If we don't, we'll break it up and do the other half on on uh, the following Saturday. Um, but we'll, we'll start, um, first of all, by discussing something very important before we, we even proceed with the slideshow. It's important to understand what was happening in American history at this period of time. In, at the time E.J. Roy was born in 1815, the Northern states were still practicing, I'm sorry, the Southern states were still practicing chattel slavery, meaning human beings were property. Human beings of African descent were property. They were in the possession and even had uh, a deeds <laughs> basically mm -hmm. to their name. So, and so you had papers, you had ownership papers um, at this point in time. And, mm -hmm. you know, to the contrary, in the Northern states, African people, in the earlier part of the 19th century, and I keep having to say 1800s because some people get that confused. They think when you say 19th century, you mean 1900s. But in the early 1800s, the, the later persecution that occurred with, to freed Blacks had not yet intensified. I'm not saying there wasn't racism and discrimination. Of course there was, because at that point in history, um, of course, you had racism and discrimination against African people in the North, but you didn't yet have all of the race riots with the incoming influx of poor European immigrants wanting to displace the relatively affluent and successful free Black community in the North. What people don't realize is the dichotomy between the population in the North and the South. There were people living in the Northern states who were successful, people of African descent who were successful yeah. um, at this period in history. And I think that needs to be said and that context needs to be spoken because many people are completely unaware. Many people think of uh, the, the United States and black people at that point in time of all being in chains and servitude yeah. in the South. And, and Carl, I just had a discussion today mm -hmm. about that, that uh, slavery was, uh, at a time Liberia was settled, at a time mm -hmm. African Americans came from here to go to Liberia, mm -hmm. slavery was still practiced here in the United States. So I was being asked, so many, many Liberians think that people, the people that were going were, you know, free slaves or ex-slaves, that they came from the plantations now you are free, and then from whatever they had them, they were going to Liberia. In, in, some, in some cases, that's what happened, especially with the people who settled in Greenville and Sino. 
Okay. So the people in Sino, that was called Mississippi in Liberia. That was a Mississippi colonization society. And that population in Sino was directly liberated from plantations. So they were actual free slaves. They were liberated people who were formerly enslaved. And as part of their liberation, they were required to leave the United States um, of, of America because they were unwanted. Um, in the South. So Mississippi, in, 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 in Mississippi in Africa, was which, which is what Sino uh, was originally called, Mississippi in Africa, was settled by liberated um, enslaved people. And there were different, you know, we talked in the past about recaptured Africans. We talked, I mean, even on the subsequent voyages, after the first two, you had many people who were born slaves. But the very first um, group of recaptured Africans, I'm sorry, repatriated Africans most of them, especially for the Elizabeth and the Nautilus, the first two ships were born free and they were from the Northern States. Later on, people who were liberated, like the Yuri family and, and the uh, Tubman family and many others were in fact the descendants of liberated uh, enslaved people. But they themselves, they themselves were liberated and sent, not just their parents. Yes. Okay. Wait a minute. You're asking. So, for example, the yeah. the 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 ancestors of the modern juries were themselves in, liberated, put on ships with the Yuri family. It's very fascinating story. We should probably do a show about it. But they were given a lot of resources. They were also liberated with other Africans or, or liberated black slaves and you know, enslaved Africans, and sent to Liberia with these other people as servants. Think about this. So you're, you're being liberated because you're the biological children of a, a slave owner and a, you know, a, 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 an enslaved woman. And in his will, he liberated them, sent them with, with some resources and also other liberated slaves to be of service to them while they were in Liberia. Clothing, other articles and things like that. So that family arrived in Liberia, not only with wealth, but with people to work for them. Yes, and they were they were they were uh, biracial. They were they were they were descendants of, of European African uh, parentage. And when you say the Eurasian, you're talking about like the family of Benin. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of resources. And then then you have the Tudmans who were liberated, who were full blooded Africans, and sent to Maryland. And most of the, those those who were sent to to Sino which was at that time Mississippi and Africa, most of those uh, people were, were full-blooded Africans. So they, they were Africans, they, they, uh, they were serving as slaves here. Yes. They, so it was not like a generation later, those- No, they were directly were? from plantations. You're liberated, here's your walking papers, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. but you also had, again, a good number of people coming from northern states who were born free, who mm -hmm. were educated. The very first repatriated African Americans were mostly missionaries. So they were very educated. They were going to open schools and, and, and help to, in their language at the time, civilize the recaptured Africans and the native uh, people in the, in the vicinity of Liberia. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's not you, one story. You're talking about, you know, many, many ships over a, a period of a number of years. Good, interesting story. Mm -hmm. so, so now we fo the focus is now Edward James Roy, who yes. was in the north. Who was, who was uh, from the north and, and from a very prosperous, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, as we would say in, in, the, in those days, as they would say, uppity you know, family of, of uppity. And and the other thing that's interesting is he wasn't he wasn't a light skinned, you know, there was a lot of color uh consciousness at that time. So the lighter skinned you were, because this is an era where white supremacy, this 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 pseudo, you know, philosophical, pseudo scientific scientific nonsense of white supremacy was 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 swallowed by everyone including yeah. you know the objects of its oppression which is black people so black people had um you know if you were lighter skinned you felt you were better off 
if you were educated, if you were acculturated into European, when I say the word European, I don't like to use the word black and white. We talk about European culture, African culture, European Americans, African Americans. Mm -hmm. So the people in the North typically were light-skinned free blacks, light-skinned freemen as they were called. And so they were mostly, you know, the, the genetic offspring of European and Africans who had mixed. In the case of Edward James Roy, his parents were full-blooded Africans. So this was, this, you know, incredible because majority of those affluent Blacks in the North were not full-blooded Africans. Okay, what does that mean, full-blooded African? It means they were not mixed ancestry European and African. Okay. It means they were just Africans living in America. They didn't have European ancestry. Okay. And in fact, we'll, we'll get into what he, and, and not only did he not have European ancestry, but his, his father, his father spoke a dialect and knew who he was and was able to teach his son some of his dialect. Who upon his return to West Africa, when he went to Liberia, was able to recognize some of the recaptured Africans residing in, 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 in you know, their language and what they were speaking, he was somewhat familiar with it mm. because of what he had been taught by his father, which is one of the reasons I even question if he was evil um, in the first place. But we'll get to that. Okay. So this guy, E.J. Roy, I mean, who are his parents? Yes. Yeah. So E.J. Roy... Um, so he, he was basically, um, his, his parents were, were called John and Nancy. Now, I've been digging to try to see if I can find a lot more information about John and Nancy. It's said that they came from, um, you know, from Kentucky. But anyway, he was um, born on, at Edward, uh, Edward James was born on February 3rd, 19, I mean, oh my God, I put 1915. It should be 1815. Yeah, 18. You know, I don't have an editor. <laughs> I wear many hats. It should be 1815. I apologize. So um, Edward, Edward James was born um, in Newark, Ohio, not Newark, New Jersey, but Newark, Ohio. Um, and, you know, Liberia had not yet been established when he was born. Um, the 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 the, the uh, settlement at Sierra Leone had been established, or Freetown had been established, but there was no Liberia, and we have talked about this timeline in previous episodes. Mm -hmm. So we'll go to, we'll go to the next slide. But before you do, look look at his look at look at this. This man was clearly African. You know, mm -hmm. you, you contrast this man with. I mean, I've seen illustrations of him where they tried to kind of Europeanize him, make him a little bit more brown or lighter brown and stuff like that. But the actual photographs of him uh, when he was in Liberia tell a different story than the illustrations that were done. He was, you know, definitely um, an African. Uh, so his his parents, according to the historic record, that they 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 came from. Oh, uh, Kentucky and migrated to Ohio. It's a little suspicious to me because I'm trying to, to in my mind, grasp this idea of this person being in Kentucky, um, going to Ohio, yet he could read and write and he knew how to operate a ferry. He was familiar with the whole Mariner thing. There's a lot of fog around that. At this period of time, you had a lot of West Africans who traveled freely to the United States on merchant ships as workers and traveled throughout the world on merchant ships as workers. And we've talked about this in previous episodes with people, um, you know, John Kizzel, people like this who had owned vessels and had been traveling, you know, um, on merchant ships. So the idea that this this man would have come from Kentucky and been fluent in his language, his, his African language, is just not fitting well with me. So there does need to be more research done around that. 
Um, it, it, it reeks of vibes of that. This guy really was, was like a straight up African and not, not really um, from Kentucky. Perhaps Nancy was, but there's a lot of um, strange, you know, stuff around this. The other thing that was happening around this time, you also had a lot of, uh, of fur traders, um, uh, African American merchants who were free migrated to the United States not as slaves, but as traders mm -hmm. that were in places like Illinois and Ohio, so along the Mississippi River. So there were also, so the other thing we have to understand is while the vast majority of African people who came to the United States came in chains, there are examples of African people freely migrating to the United States as traders, as explorers, as entrepreneurs. This did happen. And I think it's important for us to talk about that because right. a lot of us don't, even people living in America don't realize that this is a, a, an important and, and necessary part of the history that gets overlooked. While it is a small min minority of of the population of African Americans, there are incidents of African people freely coming to the United States, not in chains. And so, again, my suspicion is that this is, this is the kind of person Roy's father was. Because right. that, Paula, let's take a short break so you can fix your your, oh, your audio. Going out again. I don't know why yeah, so you, can, so you can fix oh, it. Someone's trying to call me. That's why. Okay, I'll go yeah. and come back. Thank you. Uh, uh, all right. I want to go Welcome back. This is the Library History Channel. Your presenter is Carl Family. Carl, you're saying there were some Africans who were coming to the United States, though small, you know, for, for trade. They were yeah. not brought here as slaves. Yeah, who came on their own volition. I mean, if you think about it, we had also a number, let's just focus on Liberia, <laughs> pun intended. But look at the, the, the crew posts, right? Look at the Gribble and crew boys that used to go and volunteer to jump on board merchant ships and go and work and travel the world and return. So this was happening even before 1822. The ships would come into harbor. They wanted to have a, you know, this is adventurous. You get on the, you want to be a, a, a deckhand. They, you would go to the, you know, get it and, hey, can I work for you? They spoke their little broken Portuguese, they spoke their broken English, and they would be employed. They would go to Liverpool, they'd go to the Caribbean, and they'd be brought back home. And some of these ships they worked on were carrying human chattel. Right. Right? And so, but they themselves were free to go back home. And so they travel the world and they go back with whatever they earned, and they become extremely respected and important people would admire them because they were adventurous. Sometimes they'd be abused, sometimes they'd be killed, sometimes they would run away at some foreign port and never return. So there were there's a lot of these stories that are lost and I think it's important for us to understand the context of this. If you watch the movie Amistad, it's so yeah. historically accurate in so many ways. There's a scene where the young lawyer has learned how to count to 10 in Mende. And he's looking for an interpreter for the Amistad captives. So he goes to the docks where he knows there's going to be a lot of West African workers who are free and had volunteered to work on these ships. And he starts walking around the shipyard, shouting, counting in Mende, one through 10, repeatedly. And someone hears him that understood what he was saying and comes up to him and starts speaking Mende. And he's like, oh, this is wonderful. You understand this language. I need an interpreter. And so here's a free person 
who was working on a ship, who now goes and serves as an interpreter because they were able to discover that one of these Africans was a Mende speaking person. And that is how the Amistad captives were able to have their story narrated to the courts. So I just wanted to emphasize that, that there's just mm-hmm. numerous examples of this. Uh, but we'll return to the slideshow. Right. And, and you were saying why there is no evidence that the father of Egypt or uh, came from Africa is likely. That... Right. Not that there's no evidence. I haven't seen evidence. Yeah, but you it's all it. circumstantial. The, the, the record simply states he comes from Kentucky. I cannot find him in Kentucky, which doesn't mean it's not true. I just think, you know, I need to do a little more digging and it may take me months or years to figure this out. But I think there's just too much pointing to the, to the possibility, the probability even, that, uh, that John Roy uh, may have not even been, you know, really African American. He may have been African African, like you know, but we'll 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 see. Right. And, you know. So again, this is my this is just a theory. I'm not saying that this is fact. Um the 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 established historic record says that he and Nancy came from Kentucky to Ohio. Yeah. That's important to distinguish the established history from what I what I what I what I thinking, a theory that I have, it's a possibility. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, let, before you do, so right. it's also important to talk about the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana um, borderland for the Underground Railroad. So they're saying these people came from Kentucky to Newark, Ohio, um, which makes sense because that was what the, the typical pattern was. Ohio at this time also was a safe haven and almost like a non-racial place for African people to go to. It had really well-established uh, free Black communities in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, comedian uh, Dave Chappelle bought a huge farm in Ohio. And one of the reasons he stated he did so was because the historic uh, farms that African Americans had in Ohio in the early 19th century. And he said he felt that that was a very uh, liberated um, and liberal minded uh, a place to go. So Ohio used to be very different from it is what it is today. And the reason there was a demographic shift in Ohio is it went from having all of these enlightened European Americans to having a huge influx of new immigrants from Europe who were quite hostile to African people. And this was one of the reasons Roy later had to leave the United States and many other African Americans um, had to either leave or were or were persecuted. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll go to the next slide. Yeah, still on this slide. So mm-hmm. John and Nancy were Abo people. Yes, and the Korean right. Yes. So here, here, here's what. Um, so I put on here that they were Abo, which is what we call today Igbo, right. or they were Egba which is a branch of the Yoruba, like CTO King. This is important because Igbo and Yoruba are not the same. Right. They're not the same. Historically, they're not the same language. And Ebo and Egba are often confused. Those two languages are often confused by European American scholars. So. Saying that E.J. Roy was evil um, when he was able to communicate with the Egba of Liberia when he arrived in their dialect, I mean, to a very minimum level, suggests to me that there is a possibility that instead of Igbo, he may have been Egba. Yeah. But again, that needs some exploring. But the established historic record is that he was Igbo. He did not, and so... At a period of time, there was a stereotype about Igbo people all over the Caribbean. They used to call them the Red Eagles because, for the most part, they looked different, okay. right, from from other Niger Delta Africans. Whereas Roy looked more phenotypically Yoruba. Right. So the Egba appearance would make a little more sense, but 
we're getting at, you know, we're getting into different theories now and not really, uh-huh. but again, the established historic record is that he was evil. I just wanted to point out that he was able to communicate with the recaptured Africans in Liberia who were Edba. And how did uh, John, mm-hmm. I think uh, John had little money. Mm-hmm. He said he worked as a ferry operator. Yes. He purchased a nice home. I mean, it, did that give him money as a ferry operator? Oh, yes. Because most, I mean, to operate a ferry at that time on the Ohio River was a skilled, a highly skilled job. So if you were a boat captain, right. you know, this was not a small thing. This was a highly skilled job, well-paying job. And this was a job that a lot of European Americans could not do, which is what makes me question again, where did this guy come from? You yeah. know, he's familiar with this mariner work at this high level. So he wasn't just a deckhand, he was operating the ferry. Hmm. You know, he was the captain. He was the ship captain or the ferry captain, you know, um, on the Ohio River. So, so the other thing is Roy attended integrated schools. Because remember, Ohio was extremely liberal before the influx of, 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 the, of those Europeans. So he did attend integrated schools. This is extremely important to note because this, you know, is before a lot of the uh, of the um, pushback against um, African people in the northern states. So integrated school meaning both white and black or European? He went to school where he was taught with European Americans, sat next to them in class, and yes. So he went to integrated schools in Ohio. That's important. Mm-hmm. Then so it's the two. Yeah, in 1822, his father sold the property in Newark and went to Illinois. So remember, I was talking about all of the fur traders on the 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 uh, on Lake Michigan. A lot of African Americans were trading on the Mississippi River on Lake Michigan. They were interacting with Native Americans and obtaining. This was a very lucrative business. Mr. Roy, Mr. John Roy, was able to acquire land in Illinois and real estate. So Mr. John Roy acquired land and real estate. Um, And then in 1829, he became ill and passed away. Left all of his property to end his land to to, to Edward, to Edward James Roy in 1829. So at that time, when his father died, he would have been about 14 years old, and he inherits all of this property. Remember, this is the early 1800s. His mother couldn't inherit it, nor could his sister, but he did. So now he becomes the man of the family. And he needs, he has all of the, everything his father worked for becomes his property. So mind you, he at this time has property rights. So in 1832, he was 17, he graduated from high school and he enrolled at Ohio University in Athens. He graduated just three years later. He was extremely, extremely brilliant. And because of his brilliance, because of his um, uh, unusual intelligence, exceptional intelligence, he was mentored by Salmon Chase, who was a very uh, wealthy, the, uh, the son of a very wealthy a white uh, European American, um, who later on went to do great things. Uh, uh, Carl, this is uh, 1835, not 1935. Yes. I, please forgive me. It didn't take him 103 years to graduate <laughs> from Ohio State. <laughs> please forgive me. I need help sometimes with doing these things. I just kind of just, you know, rush through and I apologize. Mm-hmm. I wear too many hats. But thanks for the correction. That's that's not, uh, not uh, the 20th century. It's 1832 and he graduated in 1835. So here is an uh, an uh, as you say, full-blooded African. 
So we have this African American in the United States. This is the 19th century owning properties and right? leaving them to leaving the property to his son. Right. So someone may say, "Hey, I mean, they talk about the segregation. They talk about the slavery. What's going on here?" Ohio isn't Mississippi in 1835. That's what's going on. Okay. America. <laughs> yes, and America was not what it is today in this at this period of time. And we didn't have this huge influx of new European immigrants yet at this point in time. There were some, but you know, so this is right before this massive wave of European, the new European immigrants starts coming in. Right. So these people are Puritans. These people are Puritans. They are European, uh, uh, enlightened Europeans. These are the same people who came up, you know, worked as abolitionists. These are the same kinds of the people in Ohio are the ones who believed in, you know, human equality and all of these kinds of things. So you've got a very enlightened population of European Americans, mostly of English descent. This, demogra this demographic is going to shift with the influx of the starving Europeans coming to America for shelter. For refuge, they are now going to start to fight these African people who are living better and living more prosperously than they are. Yeah, of course. So, Royce, one of Royce's teachers and mentors was uh, Solomon Portland Chase. Uh, he was uh, uh, at Ohio University very, um, not too much older than Roy. Um, I think he was maybe, you know, 10 or so years older than Roy, but he was, he started off as a teacher at this, at this, at this institution. He befriended Roy and just was, a, you know, really, really uh, impressed with his brilliance. And they became very good friends. Um, Chase went on to become the sixth chief justice he was governor of Ohio. He was a U.S. senator, and he was also secretary of the Treasury. You can look him up. But this was Roy's friend, mentor, teacher at Ohio University. Um, you know, when he, while he was there, I don't. I wanted to point that out just to show you um, when we're talking about this uh, population of of enlightened European Americans. Chase was one of those. Um, great thinkers of American history and his, in his interaction with, with, with Edward James Roy, who was also a very uh, brilliant um, and, and, and well um, accomplished and well read. Roy, 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 uh, E.J. Roy was a true scholar um, and, and had the, the luxury of being a scholar. Um, but we can go, and he, he also, because Chase uh, was his mentor, he tried to be a teacher after he graduated from uh, university um, from the from the university. He tried to go on and be a teacher, and he didn't really do that for too long. He didn't enjoy it. It was not his area. So later on, he decided to follow in his father's footsteps and become a businessman. Hmm. So he moved to uh, Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, where he opened the city's first bathhouse and barbershop, which was next door to the most affluent hotel in the city, um, in fact, in the entire area. So here's this African-American guy, very black guy, opening up a bathhouse and barbershop. And at that time, everyone had their hair cut, you know, by, by, by African-American people. You know, though that's a position, I mean, it was like something that it was like a niche market for them. Being a barber was something, um, uh, you know, it, very important. In fact, I read that they didn't have their first white barber until the, the 1850s. So mm -hmm. you have this service area right next door to one of the most affluent hotels in the area. So he's making a ton of money charging the highest end prices for you know at, for service to these very wealthy european american travelers so they're going there they're getting their hair cut 
they're getting shaved, they're, you know, having these steam baths, they're having their shoes shined, they're having all of these services. And he owns a multi-story building. Oh, wow. That his facilities are in. He owned it. So this is this is not, you know, he, he was extremely, extremely successful. However, by 1840, the whole mood of the country started changing. By 1840, you start having European, more European immigrants coming through Ellis Island. Mm. There, a lot of them are in the streets of New York, practically homeless. They are destitute. So the government of the United States, with its limited resources at this period in history, starts pushing them westward, which is, you know, towards places like Ohio that have more open land. Now, this is areas where African Americans have had farms, they have built right. their own towns, they have built wealth, they have become educated, you have black doctors, lawyers, business people, you have whole towns in Ohio that are relatively affluent and black. And now you have this influx of very poor new immigrants from Europe coming in and this resentment. And they, they have, you know, the world at this period of time has bought into this ideology of race. Right. They've bought into this ideology of race and they've, they've swallowed it and they've, 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 they, they became angry. They became agitated. So there's a lot of race riots and racial violence and they start burning people's communities down. They start attacking affluent African-American communities. This continued all the way to the 20th century. But really that turning point is right around 1840 in the Northern States. Before this, the Northern States didn't have that. It was the new immigrants that really brought that kind of, you know, mm. hatred and division. And and the, the reason they came was by design, right? The United States was bringing in more, or, or how they got here, if you... Well, yeah, yeah. so this is, a, the United States is an immigrant country. So the whole idea of it was they needed to populate the place. And you have a group of people who are wanting to bring more, you know, people that look like themselves. They want more European Americans to come in. And they're also fighting the indigenous people as they move west. They're committing genocide. They need to fill that land with more people. Also at this period of time, Europe is going through a series of famines and all kinds of hell is going on in Europe. So you have tons, masses of people trying to get to the new world for refuge, doing anything they can, selling their souls to Satan if they could, you know, to come to America, the land of hope and opportunity. So you have this huge influx of Europeans, very poor, destitute, and uneducated. Right. Uneducated. And, and so when people are poor and they have no opportunities, even in Africa, they try to bring tribalism because uh, you want you want something that you don't probably don't deserve or you don't have you're not qualified for, so you have to use tribalism. So at this time, I'm thinking in the back of my head, these are destitute, so they have to induce or introduce racism. So that they can get things from people, you know, wealthy white people, even though right. they're not qualified. Because, because the concept, the concept of being white is is, is fictitious, right? You, so it, you're a human being, and and you come from Europe, but you you're you're not, you know, you're not uh, of the caliber of a Mr. Chase, who's highly educated. You you may look like him as far as your skin's concerned. But you, you're not at the caliber of even, you know, John Roy before you'll be the caliber of his son, Edward James Roy. And you're certainly not of the caliber of, of a Salmon Chase. Right? Right. So these people coming in, mostly illiterate and, and unskilled. Many were farmers. There was, you know, there was a there was all kinds of things they had gone through. Now, now they're coming in, and what justifies their humanity? This false concept of whiteness. It continues to this day. You have immigrants coming to the United States today from Eastern Europe, yeah. and they're not just human immigrants. They, 
you, the moment their feet touch the ground, they're white. Well, right. is that a thing, really? You know, so it, 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 at that point in history, the, the, the established generational European Americans were looking down on them. So they, they, in turn, wanted to look down on the African people as well. Right. And so this is the real beginning of something else. Because you've got the Industrial Revolution, you've got factories opening up, you've got a lot of things that are about to start happening. And they're now in competition with African Americans for resources. And so here come the burnings and the lynchings. Here comes the hatred. Here comes the displacement, the mass murders, the what they call race riots, which were not, you know, riots at all. They were mass lynchings, really. Um, so this this is starting to happen, and and and, and EJ Roy is looking at himself, his mother, and his sister, the surviving members of the family. You know, he's like, we've got to go. We've got to get out of here. Um, I don't want us to be a target, you know, of what's happening all around us. He's starting to get threats. And so he first looked at Haiti as an option. And then because of the language gaps and everything, he then said, okay, Liberia could be possible, the Commonwealth of Liberia, which was not a country yet in 1846 when he, when he decided to go. So he, his sister and his mother boarded a ship for Liberia. Um, you can go to the next slide. The, the mother has... By this time, his mother died in 1840. I'm sorry, he and his sister. I keep thinking his mother. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and and uh, why they are sending the, uh, these European Americans now to Ohio and all this, uh, in a way, this was a, a welfare, right? Because mm -hmm. trying to give them free things, go and take the land, go and have this, right? Right. So here's the thing. So there's one account that says his mother died in 1840. Another account says she was on the ship with him. There was an account of two women with his name, with the name Roy, mm -hmm. on the ship with Edward. So I'm going to leave that part as a question mark. Mm -hmm. So there's one account that's saying his mother did die in 1840. There's another that says his mother died later in Liberia. We'll leave that as a question mark. But yeah. the the most important point here is he, he definitely did emigrate to Liberia with his sister. Yeah. So when he got to Liberia, here's a beautiful here's a beautiful thing of it. I mean, he got to Liberia. He started right away investing because he he left with a lot of money. He sold everything he had and he left. And so he had resources when he arrived. And he immediately gets into trade. Um, he immediately gets into trade. And one of the, the incredible things that um, before he got into politics is that he actually had a merchant ship. And Edward was the first, um, the ship was called the, I'll spell it. It's the E-U-S-I-B-I-A. Eusebia Roy is what it was called the Eusebia Roy, and it was the first ship to carry the Liberian flag, the first ship to carry the Liberian flag to the port in Liverpool, Pool. the first ship to carry the Liberian flag to England, I mean, to the United States as well. Hmm. So he went to England and he went to the United States with the Eusebia Roy. So he, he was able to amass enough wealth to acquire his own ship, and the Eusebia Roy started to trade. Wow. Now the climate is changing still. So it's not only the northern states, but you're also having a lot of resentment towards where in the past, because of course we know he wasn't the first because John Kizzle and others owned vessels before him. But mm -hmm. the reason this is becoming an issue is because the world is shifting. There's becoming a consciousness of whiteness now. And a consciousness, you know, that, you know, the free blacks who are trading and competing with us, it doesn't fit our needs and our narrative. Yeah. So then there becomes a lot of economic sabotage towards men like E.J. Roy. 
He also decides that he's going to get involved in Liberian politics because at that time he needed to make sure that his interests, his business interests and the business interests of all Liberians would be protected right. because he noticed that many of the decisions that were being made by members of the Republican Party of Liberia, which preceded the True Whig Party of Liberia, many of those members in his mind were, first of all, most of them were um, uh, Euro of European African mixed ancestry, people like James Briggs Payne, people like, of course, our first president, Joseph Jenkins Roberts. So Roy felt a kinship to the recaptured Africans and the educated, assimilated uh, native Africans, native Liberians. So he felt more a kinship with the native Liberians who were assimilated and the the, the, the recaptured Africans that he did with the other uh, leaders in the country. He was extremely radical about that because he felt mm -hmm. that they were kowtowing and bowing to the whole establishing Western hegemony, this whole imperialist mentality, and that they were allowing themselves to be controlled and dictated to, especially economically, the government of Liberia by the by the European powers and the European American powers. So his issue was, hey, you cannot allow these people to exploit Liberian resources. Right. We should be doing this ourselves. And so honestly, Roy thought they were not very smart. He it wasn't only about them being a little bit, you know, self sabotaging. He thought they were he thought they were they were cowards and idiots. Because he had so much success in the United States, he knew that Liberians were capable of mm. economic success, all Africans, <laughs> on African soil. And this was E.J. Roy's greatest crime against the Western world, was having the audacity to respect himself. Right. You can you can respect yourself and, and, and stand up and kind of raise your head that you are kind of and be African and then have the audacity to say, well, since my politicians aren't doing it, I will be a politician and mm -hmm. I will. Well, the reason you had you know Joseph Jenkins Roberts and others doing the things that they did was because it was it was safe. <laughs> it was safe to do those things. Right. You know. So, so Roy joined politics. He became he member of politics. So he was extremely rich. So he, he joined politics and probably just you know used cash violence to get yeah. to where he needed to go, <laughs> right? Because he was he was powerful. And so you have these 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 guys who are the the old guard, the, the Republican Party of Liberia. These these these, these um, they're also wealthy, but they're not nearly as wealthy as Roy. And they're controlling things, and Roy's like, you know, we're, we outnumber you guys. Right. We, we, the, 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 the native Africans with the uh, recaptured Africans, we black-skinned Liberians outnumber you people, and, and I'm going to run for office. He eventually became Speaker of the House of Representatives, yeah. um, Secretary of the Treasury, and he served in many, many positions, and he was just brilliant. But all along the way, there's a sabotage. And one of the things, there's a running theme in like ruin history where the sabotage begin, begins with propaganda. Yeah. So when a person like Roy raises their head and, and stands up erect like you know a human being on their two feet with their head up high, they start to sabotage the person and it run propaganda. And, that, and that's, that's pretty much what happened um, to, to uh, E.J. E. Roy. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Right, that, that propaganda sound like even though Tadma was not alive at that time, it sounds like a <laughs> Tadma doing it. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. So I mean, there's a lot of similarity between Roy and um, Talbert, especially Ab Talbert, who wasn't president, but you know, very very forward thinking. But anyway, um, so there's an African-American ambassador to, to Liberia. At that time, he was an ambassador to Liberia and he was African-American. 
a lot of a lot of the in fact all of the amb early ambassadors to Liberia from the United States were, were African American and uh, and Jeff uh, uh, excuse me uh, James Milton Turner which is another extraordinary human being I put this book here I have a copy of this book if you are really really interested in hearing a perspective of a of a person of African descent though he was an African American not a Liberian who served as ambassador to Liberia. Um, if you're really interested in hearing that perspective, a non-European American perspective on Liberian history or Liberian politics at the time, because it was a contemporary, this book is incredible. It basically compiles the correspondence, letters and, and documents that he, he wrote, and it, 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 they basically edited it into a book. And so you get to hear his account of what's happening. And he, he's the person who really gives a very good account of, of E.J. Roy's last days and also the propaganda and the lies and the confusion around him and how they, he, would, they, he had to fight this, uh, this sabotage. And uh, yeah, the, the book is, is called Liberian Politics, the portrait by an African-American diplomat, by African-American diplomat, um, J, uh, J. Milton Turner. Um, go to the next slide. Please. So basically, I mean, it's small, but that's that's what Turner looked like. Pretty cool looking guy. <laughs> but he served as ambassador of like and you see, this kind of bear is coming back, right? You see, guys. <laughs> right. <right there. laughs> so he served as ambassador of, of like from 1871 to 1878. So he spent seven years, um, you know, in like Europe. So his official diplomatic correspondence over that seven years is what is in that book. Um, it documents like a struggle um, in political institutions, the process of developing. It talks about he he really really breaks down uh, the and he does it in a diplomatic way. Remember, he's an agent of the U.S. government, right? Yeah. He's, he's an ambassador of the United States government, and and even though Liberia had been independent since 1847, the U.S. did not recognize Liberia as a country until two years before Milton. Turner, um, James Milton Turner was uh, assigned there. So Liberia wasn't even recognized by the United States as a country until 1868. And Turner went there, um, I'm sorry, three years later. So Turner um, really, really is the first person outside of ACS from a diplomatic perspective to present information on what was actually happening in Liberia. And mind you, he is in, in a man of African descent. So much of what Turner's accounts contradicts ACS accounts. Turner believed that Roy was murdered. ACS accounts say Roy drowned. There's even this whole thing about, oh, the drowning of E.J. Roy. I mean, they were adamant that this man drowned. Yeah. And uh, I believe Mr. Turner, because he actually saw Roy's body, and he describes it in detail in this book. He describes what he saw. He talks about what Roy's wife said. And so there's... Clearly, if you compare ACS accounts from the African repository with what Ambassador James Milton Turner writes, it's night and day. And you can see that there's the, the sequence of events as described by Ambassador Turner. It's logical and it makes sense. What ACS writes is just really foggy and it's not as, 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 it doesn't make as much sense. And so you can see the propaganda and you can see who really was pumping up Joseph Jenkins Roberts and others to get rid of Roy. And you can really see that the American Colonization Society, who had economic interests in Liberia above all else, was really pumping up the Liberian Republican Party and trying to avoid the creation of this black controlled true Whig party. So ACS, even after independence, they still has their hands on Liberia. They were still there with economic, you know, interests, trade interests, 
And so it was it was against the best interest of the American European American business people who were uh, exercising their investment through the auspice of ACS. Wow. It was against their best interest for men like Roy to prosper. Yeah. And so what we read in elementary school was uh, Roy was swimming with a bag of money. That <laughs> and the bag of money weighed him down and he drowned. I mean, that's <laughs> that's, the, that's the, 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 the ACS version. And it absolutely who, who, who says that? Who says stuff like that? That a, a rich man is, is, is swimming with a bag of money. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the ACS version, and that's the version that that um, most Liberian history books carry. Yeah, and so why would ACS write that? Because ACS doesn't want to be, you know, liable for this man's death for helping to overthrow and and, and assassinate a president, unconstitutionally impeach a president. I mean, there's many things that were done to EJ Roy, which we'll get into next week. But I wanted to, you know, close my presentation with, 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 with Ambassador James Milton Turner and let you know that next Saturday we are going to examine his version and of, of the events surrounding the extraordinary death. We've just covered the extraordinary life. Now we're going to focus on the extraordinary death of Edward James Roy through the eyes of Ambassador James Milton Turner. And we're going to contrast that with the American Colonization Society version. And we will allow the those who watch and listen to pick the sense out of the nonsense, as we like to say on the show. And if you're watching, please uh, call the number 605-313-6004. This code is 791403. Call and participate. Let's have a discussion. The Extraordinary Life of Edward James Roy. Yes. As the fifth president of Liberia. I mean, he he almost was like his mentor, right? He went from, uh, he was chief justice, he was secretary of the treasurer, just like his mentor. He yes. President. Yes, and that was why, that was one of the reasons I, I wanted to point that out. Like he started out as a teacher and he, the only difference between Roy and his mentor is that Roy also followed in his father's footsteps and was a very successful businessman as well. Yeah. Let me read a few comments here. Fix Electronics is love everywhere history channel. Elvis is welcoming home. James Barclay, when I was talking about master, master, this crew man said, move your mouth from crew people. <laughs> <laughs> master, master. <laughs> Patrick Kona said, hello guys, I'm Patrick Kona from Liberia Band Barclay, Johnsonville. Thanks for the show. I hope you people can bring out more of our Liberian history for us to know who we are and where we're coming from. Once again, thank you, God bless. Thank you, James Bagley, as Reverend James Bagley said, great revelation, this is worthy undertaking. We must master our history, even if we don't have master, master. <laughs> Philip, uh, thanks so much for the show. It is greatly educative. Uh, Carla Genesis, say hello. And, uh, Pastor Jeremiah Mayunga, are the descendants of E.J. Roy in Liberia? Uh, King Zidis, greeting from Australia, Mr. J, Mr. Jai and Madam Famula. Sometimes they call me that J. <laughs> you might be asked this call, how did you get to know all this as young as you are? I time travel through books. <laughs> <laughs> I time travel through books and through archives and, you know. <laughs> and, and let's talk about royal descendants. Are there any royal family we have? Or I, I know some royal, but I don't know if you are related to uh, E.J. Roy. Yeah, so this is a good question. I know that he had a daughter and he had some, he did, he did have descendants because the uh, British tried to sue his descendants for, um, so-called the, their bogus loans, but we'll get into that next week. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, he, I don't know if they live in Liberia anymore, but yes, he did have he did have descendants. And Sam is asking for that book. I love this show. You guys are doing a great work. Can I get the book of Ambassador Turner on Amazon? 
I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can. Um, I'm not sure. If, I always tell people, um, try to get books at your library because <laughs> they get expensive. Um, try to, you know, get books. If you're, if you're in the States, most of these books that we talk about, you can access them through, if you're a university student, through your university library, um, or uh, you can probably purchase it on Amazon um, or a, you know, there's a lot of ways you can get it. Um, I do know this particular one's expensive. I think I paid uh, about $160, something like that for it. So if it's on Amazon, it's, it's probably over $100. Uh, but it should be available at most public libraries. I can't hear you again, Dennis, sorry. What, what were some of the activities of EJ I know, or has Senator, I mean, Chief Justice, has Representative Speaker, do we have any record of what he did in those roles? Yes, we're going to talk about those next week because <laughs> it's already 9.30. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to. So one of the, the things that he did was he, he was, um, let me just give a general overview. I'm not going to go into nitty gritty detail, but one of the things that he, he did was he was um, one of the, the, not the first, but he was a huge, huge uh, um, advocate of Liberianization, meaning empowering there were a lot of crew business people, um, uh, coastal people, uh, very wealthy crew and gribble merchants. He wanted to try to empower them more. He wanted to uh, reduce the influence of uh, European uh, merchants and traders and increase the um, access to, you know, uh, trade of the of the uh, Liberian people. So he he was really influential. I, I want to even say because of him and because of his advocacy for black Liberians, dark skinned Liberians, um, non, uh, even non American Liberians, because he really identified more with the recaptured African population, which is bizarre to me, but I think it's because of his skin color, right? So the recaptured African population and the native Liberian population, especially the coastal Basa, crew, Grebo, et cetera, by these people were also business people. And many of them were also competing for the market with European Americans. He wanted to make this economy reflect the population a little bit more. Right. And so this was, again, one of the reasons when he rose to the presidency, he was axed. But it was also the reason he was extremely popular among the, the Black, Indigenous, and, 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 and Congo or recaptured African population. And when we talk about True Wig Party today, we like to demonize True Wig Party and say, oh, the True Wig Party was this hegemony of, of African Americans. It really was established by recaptured Africans, Native Africans, and Black, dark skinned um, African Americans. That's how it started. Is that how it ended? You know, I mean, Tubman was pretty dark and he was pretty 100% African too. So we got to really just look at this kind of thing. But yeah, so it's it's interesting that people think that we've only had one political party. A lot of people, if you ask the average person, they'll say, oh, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, True Whig Party. No, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, Republican Party. Th thank you. We, we had a... Uh... Two callers who, who, who drop off, but let's. Oh, uh, I'm let's, sorry, you gotta interrupt me when people call. Y'all call back. Let, let's get uh, more. Yet, this is the best historical foundation I've ever had all my life about our beloved country, Liberia. Thanks wow. to you. Call when I start to tell you, you say I'm lying. <laughs> this no, that's everything you say, but what you said, and if people don't learn about the presidents, that's okay. what I said. Okay. If you are watching and you are from Liberia, tell me what you know about our presidents. Mm -hmm. I'm telling Carl, we only learn their names. She doesn't believe me. So, so Dennis, Dennis remember he's memorizing the president's names when he was in first grade or second grade or whatever. And because he's a math guy, because he would focus on, 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 <laughs> on calculus and, and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't remember social science and civics. And I told him, I said, just because you blocked it out of your mind because you didn't think it was important doesn't mean it's not taught. All right, so we're going to see. Kofi right. Newton said, this was great history that was never taught to us here in the States. Uh, Philip said, 
I learned from this show that Sino was originally called Mississippi of Africa, but did, did the crew tribe get to be owners of Sino County? I don't know what owner is, but let's take our first caller here. Caller, your name and where you calling from? Oh, my name is Zach Kanya. Um, Mr. Ja, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to our, our very informative uh, program with uh, with uh, Madam Famula. Uh, I'm calling from Australia. Uh, Melbourne, Victoria. Um, I just wanted to say, um, look, I, I, I very much appreciate this show because, in my opinion, I've always said that Liberian history needs to be rewritten in a way that every every aspect of uh, our culture and that of the different events that that build up Liberia to what it is. To uh, to be uh, you know accounted for because um, what we are hearing now from this show shows that there are so much left behind in regards to um, information that we have learned from kids from kindergarten and all up until now. I, I strongly appreciate you two for this kind of historical uh, uh, discovery. So I uh, just wanted to just uh, put in my sense that you guys are doing very well and you guys are educating most especially we the young people in a different way. So thank you very much. Thank you. And your name is again? Zach Kanya. I'm the one you call Zedia King Zedia. Oh, oh Zach, Zach Kanya. Okay. Yeah, Zach Kanya. But Zedia King Zedia on the Facebook. Oh, okay. yeah. thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you very much to your your presenter. I mean, she's very, very much uh, oh. educating a lot of us here. Yeah. Thank you. People call me and say, where you got call from? I say, call, I've been here. <laughs> been here for long. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was interesting. So um, thank you for that call. Um, to get back to Philip's question, I was a little, I was trying to crack a joke. I said, I, I time travel through books. You know, things, the, the beauty of studying, this is not something I just started doing um, yesterday. So I've been ser a serious student of African world history, not only Liberian history, but African world history since I was, a, I was a child. I mean, I started this journey when I was about 12 years old. So this is not something that I just got up and started, you know, oh, I'm going to start reading history, you know, like five or 10 years ago. I've been doing this my entire life. Um, Thank you, Carl, for, for that. Let me take uh, okay. Isaac. Isaac Tucker, are you there? Yeah, hello. Hello. Welcome to the yeah, show. Uh, thank you very much for the show. Yeah, um, MJ Roy was a very controversial figure. And uh, I had a chance of... Uh, on him when I served on a foreign minister, J. Rita Johnson, as his research analyst. Just to add, he also earned your award this served as a Secretary of State of Liberia. It was after that Secretary of State position that he went on to become President of the Republic of Liberia. And you will notice that uh, most of the Liberian presidents were Secretary of State because at that time, Liberia, it was the way to become president, you had to become Secretary of State because Liberia was really seeking fighting international cooperation, okay? Uh, fighting to, to stay alive. Mm. But uh, mm. there is much controversy. Most of the history that people know about Roy seems to dwell on the fact that there was a black and brown controversy. I can't say why because the Jean Rowden were brown, uh, mixed mulatto. Okay. But uh, I just have a question with regards to the first agent, I would say ambassador, because America didn't want to recognize a black ambassador, the first agent that they sent, uh, whose book she showed. Okay. And uh, my concern is uh, he came in 1872 and Rod died, I mean, 1871. And Roy died in 1872. So looking at that time span, it was even less than a year 
how could he know so much about the controversy that had been going on all between uh, Ron and the mulattoes? Mm. Because uh, during that period, he wasn't around. That's my question now. Th he wasn't around. Thank you. Okay. Let, before you so, end up... That's my question. Th thank you, but before you go, before Carl comes in, when you say he was a controversial figure, what was the what, what was the controversies surrounding the EJ controversy? Ray? The controversy I'm talking about was uh, Liberia had come to be seized three times before his presidency as a nation. Okay, and uh, uh, he had went most mostly and taken a loan from London. Right. Okay. And that loan, uh, 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 the terms were was the greatest controversy. Mm -hmm. Was the greatest controversy. I don't want to take up all the time, you know. Right. That was his greatest controversy because that loan led to Liberia. It had terms that led to Liberia almost being seized too. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, 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 when I say controversy, now I'm talking about from during his presidency. Okay. okay. Because when he was a member of the House, he was a member uh, uh, of the, the, the promoted the, the former government who became president, there wasn't much of a controversy. Okay. But most of his controversy came at the expense of Liberia being seized, too. So I just wanted to delve in that in there. Because yeah, you know, most of those documents were at the foreign ministry. I don't know if it's still there now. Th thank thank, thank you. The war. Thank, thank you, Isaac. Uh, yeah, it, it, loan business is not easy even today <laughs> if they have not waived our yeah. debt. <laughs> and especially especially when they used to structure these loans in such the same way we talk about this on the show a lot, how they do these predatory loans right. in order to trap people. And so there, with next week, this is really what we're going to talk about in great detail. So I hope that you can tune in. Um, to hear all the perspectives, you know, surrounding this controversy, we wouldn't be able to do it justice in this episode while we've talked about his childhood and upbringing. There just yeah. isn't enough time. And then I think the other question you were asking me was about Ambassador Turner. Ambassador Turner was an ambassador. He was, in fact, an ambassador. I think you were questioning whether or not he was an ambassador. He was an ambassador. He was an official ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Liberia, and it, his capacity. Um, you know, the book is not only, it's not a biography of E.J. Roy, it's about his time that he served as an ambassador from 1871 to 1878. And he's talking about Liberia and the, the politics in the country at the time. Right. Because remember, uh, uh, Joseph Jenkins Roberts became president again after Roy was killed. Not immediately after, but the very next election, it was Roy, I mean, it was Joseph Jenkins Roberts again. So you've got um, he's present for all of this. He's present for all of the uh, uh, color wars, you know, the, um, and, and, and he was also present for Roy's murder. He saw Roy's body. And so the correspondence between himself and the U.S. Secretary of State, who was his boss, is extremely detailed in this book. And we will cite some of the things that he talks about, and we'll quote some of the letters. Um, he was not the one who talked about all of the information preceding Roy's death, his early life, or even his political career, though he does mention it, um, of course. But what the reason I brought him up is because the, 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 the controversy surrounding his death was all occurring when he arrived. Right. Roy's uh, the deposition, everything occurred when Turner arrived and he was the American ambassador. So even the agents of the American Colonization Society, you know, had to pass through Turner, this black man. So this is important to note. And, and Carl, if, even if he were there for six months, mm -hmm. I mean, he was still in the diplomatic cycles. Exactly. If he took over Liberia, he's gonna read documents, he's gonna read papers, he's gonna be privy mm -hmm. to you know, uh, information. Uh, yeah, First information. Information from living witnesses. <laughs> exactly, and uh, there are things there, 
I mean, I, I've, I've never uh, been an ambassador, but I'm sure people before you're going to leave some notes that you're going to go over, right? Right. Even you know why there, uh, because he was, I don't know what he did before becoming ambassador, but his eyes were on Liberia, I believe, or Africa. So he, he was still hearing those things even before becoming ambassador. But uh, exactly. thank you. We're going we're gonna to end it here tonight and uh, set the stage for us for the next episode. Still on EJ Roy. Yes. So next uh, next week, so this is now the extraordinary life we've just concluded. We are going to spend next week talking about um, the extraordinary death of EJ Roy. And his death was extraordinary. We're going to talk about all of the events leading up to his death as narrated by both Ambassador, uh, U.S. Ambassador James Milton Turner and also the records of the American Colonization Society from that era. So these are firsthand accounts from the time period, not history written century a century later, not you know someone else coming up with their version. This is going to be what two different perspectives are at the time period while it happens. And it's going to be very interesting. So mm -hmm. I can't wait. Call, but hold your thought. Let me get our last call. Oh, yeah, another he, caller. Okay. He's our yeah, regular caller. Calling. That's why I'm allowing him. Else, I was going to uh, because he's calling late. Elvis. Okay. This is Mr. Evan Morris. Hey. Elvis, every day you got a call. I appreciate you. At least I know you're supporting me. <laughs> so that's why I give him the privilege to call, <laughs> even though we are out of time. Go ahead, Elvis. Thank you for thank calling. You, thank you so much. I just, uh, I just want to thank um, this call. Today we're in 100% agreement. Um, <laughs> EJ Roy is somebody that I really admire. You know, as a child in Liberia, I always used to see that that EJ Roy building. You know, and I never really understood who he was. I never knew his history, but I think today she uh, shed a lot of light on the history of EJ Roy. And I kind of been in between the show. You know, I got some other obligations that I'm attending to today, but. I just wanted to know. Maybe she touched on it, but I, I didn't. I didn't get to watch that part of the show. She did. What what was his actual what was the actual reason why they killed him? Because you know, like girl we heard just because he was a dark skinned man and they were angry with him being president, being that he was dark skinned, he wasn't from that class of the you know, the quote unquote, you know, mulatto or light skinned, you know, settlers. So maybe she can touch on that. But somebody uh you know, actually somebody that I admired and I think he was a strong person and he was, he was one of the people that I, I actually admired from, you know, that era. Yeah, I, I don't I don't yeah, I don't believe that he was ousted simply because he was a dark skinned man. I mean, Stephen Allen Benson was just as black and just as African and just as hundred percent African, he had no European ancestry. Stephen Allen Benson was our second president. Um so he you know he preceded EJ Roy, but Stephen Allen Benson was on the Republican Party ticket, the Liberian Republican Party ticket, so he was he was uh mentored by J.J. Mm. Roberts, you know, so Black Stephen Island Benson was kind of an insider in that circle. So they had to kind of appease the masses of the citizens who were indigenous, um, the, the assimilated indigenous, the recaptured Africans, and, and then the, the darker uh, emigrants from the United States. So Benson uh, represented that class. So it wasn't just that. It was that he was just so darn radical and extremely wealthy in his own right, independently so. So that was really, it wasn't that simple. It wasn't just a mm -hmm. color thing. It was the fact that this this man was, was and, and, and pushing. Carl, you don't have to give all out because next week mm -hmm. we're going yeah. to come on the death <laughs> of EJ, right? So yeah. at least you have to tune in. So we can dig all into it. You know, yes, uh, so we're going to tune in next week and, and know that D.J. Roy was not our first full-blooded African president. That was our second president. Uh, Stephen Allen Benson was, was the first uh, purely African president of Liberia. Th thank you. On that note, we're going to be concluding tonight. But uh, tomorrow, watch On Point at 6 o'clock. You also want to watch... The uh, Labyrinth Study Association or the Labyrinth LSA, Labyrinth Study Association, they're going to have a monthly scholarly series where they're going to take a, I want to believe, a scholar and interview or do some scholarly stuff. 
these people they are all scholars right so this sunday at three o'clock they're going to be interviewing dr raptel nije pele on her book about dual citizenship so she wrote a big book that they're going to be talking about like a wonderful book <laughs> dr sire and dr <laughs> Sam Wa Johnson will be here to host Dr. Pillar. You don't want to miss it. And don't then, miss uh, it. And please yeah, buy her it. book. I just got my copy. Y'all buy her book, buy her book, buy her book. And at six, we'll be on point. Those guys that don't agree on anything will be here. <laughs> to you don't want to miss it. Carl, let's close. You're closing. Please. Yes, please tune in on Saturday. Many of your questions surrounding his death, we will discuss them, uh, hopefully answer them and uh, 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 resurrect the memory of E.J. Roy so it's in the front of our minds and that we can tell our children about yet another giant of, of Liberia upon whose shoulders we stand. Um, and this is not the only story. We're gonna tell many, many more. Um, thank you so much for watching and thanks for the positive feedback. Thank you also, Carl, for always coming. I know you wear many hats. <laughs> you always find time to be here. We want to thank our viewers for following us. Always focus on Liberia, where we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We we continue to get our people come and say we want to. We see focus on Liberia. We want to do a show. So a new show will be debuting very soon. And these guys, they are all scholars. They want to discuss Liberian, African, and global issues right here on Focus on Liberia. Yes, we want to focus on Liberia that attract these kind of shows. And uh, <laughs> we are very fortunate. I'm proud of uh, what we're doing here and want to always, always thank you for your support. At this time, we're going to close with our song that says, We, we are all like you. Like I mean, <laughs> we, we are all like today. We're talking about dual citizens. Say, oh, if you are dual citizenship, you can dual citizen, you can do this, you can do that. Oh, if you are, if you are Gio, your English is this way. When you gribble, you say, <laughs> hey, this one. We are all Liberians. And whether you believe E.J. Rock, like somebody said, oh, he wanted to extend the presidential term, that's why he was disposed, or you believe that this was a murder, come next Tuesday, but we should remember that we are all Liberians. No one person is more Liberian than the other. The only thing that we should all strive to accomplish is to make Liberia the glorious land of liberty. Have a good <laughs> We all love you,